Hi, welcome to another episode of Straight From The Desk. In this episode, we're not only going to talk about layers and glazes together as a pair um, while painting the fantastic scarf of our goblin mercenary from Lucas Pina, but we will also talk a little bit more about the topic of judging a miniature. And I think um, if you had a look at the um, painter's development sheets from the last PDF, um, you might have realized that it's not as easy as you might think to judge yourself and where you are. So I think it's good to actually spend a minute to think about the phenomena and why that can be so hard. So when we look at um, the ability of how to judge art or how we are judging art, we're looking at something where we have the time to one side of the scale and the ability to the other. And in the beginning, we might think that um, we would have like a straight line of expected growth. Like the more time we invest in our hobby, the better we get at it. But in reality, I think a lot of us have experienced that it feels quite more mm, like big ups and downs um, in the learning curve. And let us have a look at why this might be the case. And I think next to the actual ability of painting miniatures, um, which uh, feels more like a curve, we have another curve and that is actually the ability of evaluating and judging miniature art. So and if we have a look on how those two curves relate, uh, we're actually quite surprised that they don't align as we might think. So we have actually, like um, in the beginning of when we start a craft like miniature painting, we have to invest a little bit of time and um, we kind of start slowly in our learning curve. And when we get the basics down, we really experience like a huge leap in what we're actually able to create. But in the very same time, our ability to actually judge and evaluate miniatures grow much faster because we consume so much pictures and really soak up all the information that we kind of get on the topic of miniature painting. So we are much earlier able to actually tell what uh, a fantastic miniature looks like before we can actually paint it. And I think we all know that phenomena. We all have a friend like that who actually knows theoretically way more about painting than he's actually able to put down on a figure. So. Um, I think for us this actually means something very interesting because um, like both abilities steadily grow and in the end also if we look back we really have like kind of still a steady growth but we might not be able to see our own personal growth the whole time along the process. And we discover art highs where actually our ability to paint um, exceed the ability to judge or where it's on the same level. And in those phases, it's super important to not become too um, cocky about your own achievements. Um, because after the art high, there's also usually the art low, um, where we actually like learn more things. And because our um, learning curve uh, raises again uh, with the things th and the details that we see, the finesse that we discover in other people's work. And uh, in that moment, we can feel insecure about our own achievements, even if um, like our skills are totally steady or even increasing a little bit. So in that time, it can be actually really helpful to kick yourself off with either focusing on a technique or a material that you're not really good at to push yourself to the next art high. So um, for us, that could be the um, painters development sheets from the last PDF. There are also a lot of other methods that we will talk through in the next episodes. And um, for the next one, we will talk about the, the time capsule method, which is also kind of interesting, but it's more something for the long run. All right. but. Um, Finding the topics and materials and techniques actually brings us back to our goblin here. And I think for maybe any miniature, it's kind of good to make your mind up what technique could be the best to use for which part. 
because in the end, um, like you can also give yourself a hard time by choosing the wrong technique. So in the last episode, we had the wet blending technique to introduce all these like crazy color transitions on the face. And um, here, when we look at the piece of fabric or the scarf that is wrapped around its head, we're actually looking at quite a different situation. We don't have any like crazy color blends because we're going for like more like a sack linen material. And um, also the shape itself is actually somewhat geometrical. So we have these folds that really equally catch the light and our color transitions are really short. Because of these short color transitions, I decided to go with a combination of layers and glazes. And both techniques could really be used also to create a gradient um, on themselves. But here, really the combination of these two techniques work out fantastically. So let's have a look um, on why that is the case. Um, for the layering technique, we're kind of like placing opaque layers of paint next to each other that we're pre-mixing on our palette. And we're not actually blending the colors in between, but um, because we're placing our nuances like well balanced next to each other, it kind of creates a gradient for the eye. This works especially for like a smaller um, surface because the larger it gets, the easier the eye picks up the different layers. So if you want to really like create a smooth blending with layers, it needs a couple of layers to appear like a color transition. If we look at glazes, glazes are like the application of a translucent layer of paint. And you can also use it to build up your gradient by kind of stacking the glazes on top of each other. For glazes, you really gotta be quite careful and you have to make sure that you just apply an equal layer of paint that like fastly dries away without leaving stains. So um, it's a technique that is kind of also hard to repair when you use it on your own because you kind of have to glaze back the same tone again after you made a mistake. So by combining those two techniques, um, we kind of get the benefits of both. And um, like, let's see this here as an example where we have like three layers of paint. Three opaque layers stacked next to each other to create that gradient are not enough. If we look at it a little bit smaller, you know, you can see the eye does the blending a little bit better. But here for the scarf, as it's quite big, three layers won't be enough. And we could also mix, I don't know, 10 layers on the palette to get our gradient done. But that would take um, quite a lot of discipline to actually apply them always in the right order. And um, we would still see a little bit the gaps in between our layers. So instead of mixing all that many layer colors on our palette, I've decided to just stick with the three and soft out the transition in between using glazes. So with only like three layers and two tones as glazes, um, which we're applying in the transition area, we can get the job done in no time. And it's also a little bit easier to correct. All right, let's have a look on how we do that on the model. We're first starting with opaque glaze establishing our highlights. After that, we're um, softening things out with glazes. And we're also using the glazes to kind of get the smaller and finer wrinkles also accentuated. We're also introducing a bit of texture and the texture is super relevant to introduce a little bit of texture contrast between the well-blended face and the fabric part here. Later on, we're going to introduce even more texture using a different technique stippling for most of the non-metal parts, but we will talk about that in the next chapter. We're also using the layer technique to introduce opaque lines, kind of like to create a sack linen texture. After the texture is applied, we're adding a little bit of a freehand to spice up the color combination using a dark desaturated purple. And we're also introducing a little bit of a shadow as a last step that is slightly more blue to kind of pick up the colors of the face again. All right, let me show all that in detail. Thanks for your support and now enjoy the video. Okay, here we are ready to paint the fabric elements. And for the fabric elements, we will go for layers and glazes because in the initial setup, we don't actually want to introduce all too many transitions. So you can see we have like a somewhat geometrical look here of the different planes on that um, 
neck piece here. And color-wise, I want to go for like quite a bit more like a muted tone um, to contrast all these vibrant colors that we have going on in the face. So let's have a look on the palette. On the palette we have some Schmigge Titanium White. Here we have some Scurvy Green from the Game Color range. Here we have some Mustard Yellow from the Reap Paints. Over here another Reaper Paint. This is the Blood Red. Over here we have a color that we haven't been using before. This here is the P3 Battlefield Brown, just a nice dark brown tone. And here we have some of the Chimera color Carbon Black. If you remember for the face we have been using the colors um, very pure, also this here, very pure with each other. We haven't been introducing all that much black, just a teeny tiny bit for the shadows. And now we will use kind of like this similar tones, but we will add some black to gray it down. So. Um, take, um, plenty of the mustard yellow, add some black, add some white. A bit of that. We will also take a bit of that tone here, now that I like the color, and add a little bit of white. So we can use that as our highlight color. We will start to use the color here very opaque, so we're aiming for like a heavy base tone consistency and we're just covering the whole surface of it. And I'm trying to do long brush strokes. We'll just apply that and we'll be back with the dried base color. All right, okay, so here we are with our base color and you can see we have like a really nice and solid layer of it. It took me two or three layers actually to get really that nice and opaque base color established and we will need that because um, as I said in this step we will work with the layers and you can see here really nicely how the light actually gets caught on these wrinkles and I said before we don't need much of blending we want to first establish this here just with layers so again grabbing a paint in a heavy base tone consistency and We're really just placing it here sharp and pronounced and we're trying to hit the wrinkles from really the top and this is like really quite important that we don't fall into our edge highlighting background so we're trying to paint the highlight really on the top of where it's caught and not so much like um, depending on the depth of the crevice so so here we're really taking the highlight and going all the way in there. You can see we already have like an interesting level of um, contrast going on with just having those two initial tones in there. Then I'm just grabbing that also quickly here. 
get a little highlight on the edge already. Continuing slightly darker, so just in between the two. And going darker. And you can see this is almost like a wet blending but I'm not really pulling the paints into each other on a larger distance. Just here where the two meet, I'm actually adding the next layer. So adding like a few of these uh, ripped off edges, I'm just like emphasizing those with little dots. And you can see this is like a result really without any glazing, this is just layering so far. So we've been using just opaque layers of paint. And I think the level of definition is already nice if you think that we didn't spend uh, actually a second here blending anything. In the next step, um, I'm just going in there with the same kind of tone but thinner. And um, we're using that to soft things out and also to push a few highlights a bit brighter. Okay, we'll do that. Here with first taking again a little bit of the lighter color. Then we're mixing in the brighter shade. And we have our light coming down here, quite central. On, you can see that very well on the nose, but also with the reflection on the eyes. Um, so I want to bring this line here up, but just only this side of it. As if the light would be caught here on the seam line. This might seem like a little bit um, strong or harsh at the moment, but we will kind of balance all the highlights still. So, just thinning down that brighter paint to a glaze like consistency, and I'm using that to dissolve it here where it meets the highlight.
And when I work the brush, the glaze is getting thinner and thinner, and I'm now just having like a very light glaze in the brush that I can use to uh, kind of balance the intensity of the highlights, connect these finer and thinner wrinkles as well. We are also emphasizing a few of these jagged edges a bit more. Overall, I think I want to add like a little bit more of a textured look. Um, introduce a little bit of like a fine linen texture or something like a similar. Because I think like we need a little bit of textural contrast between the, the, all these blended areas. So we want to spice that up also with uh, some shadows and some freehands. Let me just continue that glazing step here and soft things out a little before we're back for the next step. All right, this is how the fabric looks with just a few additional glazes. And I'm really happy with the um, level of definition that we've achieved. And I want to continue adding texture as I mentioned earlier. And we will do that um, also here using our light color. Darkening it down just a little bit. And we're aiming for a medium layer consistency. I'm first separating it with vertical lines. And now we are continuing to fill in some lines in between. Alright, after placing these last vertical lines here, we are continuing and adding a few horizontal lines. And we want to get something really like sack linen, so we just need to get like an orthogonal line here.
and I'm going a bit brighter to have it like the texture slightly more visible here first on the edge But then also a little bit here, just dabbed on in the highlight area. So far so good. I really like that subtle texture that we've achieved. In the next step I want to add like a little bit of a freehand and um, I decided to go for um, kind of like swirly flames here uh, all along the collar and um, I would like that to be in like a weird purplish tone and yesterday while we painted the face we discovered that with mixing the red here and the scurvy green we achieve like a very interesting desaturated purple and that's the tone that I want to use for the flames. And now that we're happy with like the rough placement, we can like detail out the shapes of the flames a little bit. The nice thing is here for a goblin, we don't have to be like 100% um, accurate and um, they don't have to look like all 100% the very same. If we would go for like, I don't know, an imperial soldier or so, uh, this definitely would be 100% regular. But here this gives us uh, like, I think a nice and um, organic look also. Just correcting the shape here minimally where we're not happy.
All right, we'll just take a little bit of that slightly bluer tone here to the top. And we're using that, as you can see here, really very lightly. And we're using that light glaze here to establish a little bit of a different colored shadow. And um, these last bits here of the glaze, um, continue, uh, okay, these last bits here of the glaze um, continue, all right, these last bits here of the glaze um, are the end for our fabric here. We will later on come back and add um, teeny tiny splashes of dirt and grime. All right.